Hey, we got an awesome message. We get to hear from my main man, Tim Brown. Woo! We make some noise. What's up, bro? Isn't Billy the best hype man? I love that guy. Uh, well, hey, welcome to church. You guys doing good? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into it. So we're in week two of a new teaching series on the book of Ephesians. And if you were here last week, uh, Jason kicked the series off uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. And so uh, most of Paul's letters throughout the New Testament, if you're familiar, they're oftentimes written to uh, a specific church uh, around a specific issue or a problem or a need like Galatians and Philippians and Corinthians. Ephesians is very different. Uh, Ephesians was likely written to a whole number of churches in and around this, this area of Ephesus, which is like Asia Minor and modern-day Turkey today, and it reads more like a, a summary statement or a, a summary of Paul's vision and his unique calling to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to this new covenant family that Jesus is creating, both Jew and both Gentile, and Gentile is just another word for like everyday people like us, and so God's creating this new covenant family, and uh, Paul begins his letter with this beautiful poem of praise, which Jason covered last week, super like dense theologically, a uh, tough passage to go through. He did a great job. And then he follows up this poem of praise with a prayer, with a prayer. And that's what we're going to go through today. And uh, this is not just any prayer. Uh, Paul prays for something very specific. And he's going to pray that this, uh, a, a church in Ephesians would awaken themselves to these three truths, uh, three transformational truths that I believe have the power to change our lives. And so before we, we dive into the letter, uh, I just want to share a, a, a brief story that is an example of the kind of life that Paul is praying for. And uh, the kind of life that Paul is praying for is the kind of life that was lived by a man named Friedrich von Budelschwing. Say that five times fast. Friedrich von Budelschwing, not to be confused with Friedrich and the Poodle Swing. Oh, so bad. Man, that's a bad joke. Okay. <laughs> Friedrich von Budelschwing. So yeah, you can put the actual picture up. Uh, these are the two guys. This is the, the junior, uh, the son, and this was his dad. And uh, if you can't guess by their names, these guys were Germans. They were alive in uh, the 1930s and 40s uh, in Nazi Germany uh, during the reign of the Third Reich and, and Hitler. And uh, what you need to know about these guys is they are responsible for starting an organization called the Bethel Foundation. And the Bethel Foundation was a, a charitable care network consisting of hospitals and orphanages and clinics, all dedicated to the care of the mentally and physically disabled in the name of Jesus. Really remarkable work that these guys did. And they did all of this right in the midst of what is arguably one of the most hostile cultural landscapes in human history in Nazi Germany. And what we have to remember about Nazi Germany is this is an entire culture that uh, thought that it was a good idea that in order to progress the human race forward that we would exalt certain values like power and strength and ethnic purity and, and therefore uh, eliminate the lives of millions of human beings. Uh, a a well-known fact uh, about World War II is that millions of Jewish people were murdered by the Nazis. A lesser known fact is that hundreds of thousands of mentally and physically disabled people were also killed in the death camps because they didn't fit the Nazi vision of human progress, the, what was called Ubermensch, which was this ideal human being. And that breaks my heart. And so Friedrich Jr. was a defender of these people, right in the center of it. And uh, the way I actually heard about this story was uh, I was reading uh, the biography of another German Christian that some of you may have heard of, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, remarkable man. Uh, he was a, a German pastor and theologian who kind of rose up in Germany, uh, coinciding with the rise of Hitler and the Third Reich. And um, that's the setting where all of these stories come together. And so Bonhoeffer actually knew Friedrich Jr. pretty well. Like, they were, they were friends. And I just want to read you a description of one of Bonhoeffer's visits to this community, because he, he, he visited it quite often. So this is what it says. Bethel was a, a whole town with schools, in churches, farms, factories, shops, and housing for nurses. At the center were numerous hospital and care facilities, including orphanages. Uh, Bonhoeffer had never seen anything like it. It was the antithesis of the Nazi worldview that exalted power and strength. It was the gospel made visible, a fairy tale landscape of grace, where the weak and helpless were cared for in a palpably Christian atmosphere. And I just love that description. 
a fairy tale landscape of grace. Well, what did he mean by that? What I don't think he's describing is this like make-believe Narnia land with fairies and wizards. This was very real. But what I do believe he was describing is this is a community of people living gospel-centered lives under the reign of a different king. And this is exactly what Paul prays for in this passage, and this is exactly what my prayer is for our church this morning. And so with that, I think that suffices as a a frame of what we're getting into. Um, Let's jump into the the text. So this is Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 23. Um, He starts off this way. For this reason, which is his way of saying, in light of everything that Jason talked about last week, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So Paul's away. He's away from Ephesus now. He's actually likely in prison somewhere else. And he's hearing about the lives of these Christian churches that he helped start it, and he hears reports. And they're like really good reports. And he hears two things, two defining characteristics about what's happening And these churches, and the first is their faith, their faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, when we hear about faith in the the New Testament, we oftentimes think of something that happens in your brain. It's like an intellectual exercise. And while that's true, if you have faith in something, there is, I hope, something happening in your brain. But that's not it. That's not the only thing. Faith in the New Testament is about allegiance and devotion, And so to place your faith in the Lord Jesus is about recognizing the fact that Jesus is truly Lord and I'm putting my allegiance and my devotion in him as king and I'm grabbing onto him as the best thing that I've got going for me. It's something that happens in your brain, but even more important, it's something that is immediately connected to how you live. This is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 too, this is like if you're married in the room, this verse was probably read at your wedding. Paul says, if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. I'm nothing. And so the point is, is that faith is not just an intellectual exercise. I think that belief is the entry point to faith. But if faith does not manifest itself in the way that you live through like tangible life change, Paul would say that you have nothing. That's remarkable. And and this leads uh, to the second thing that Paul hears about. Uh, He says, ever since I heard about your faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all of God's people. So what he's not hearing about is that they're like writing little Valentine's Day love cards to each other or sending each other heart emojis. That's not love. Uh, Love in our culture uh, is primarily viewed as an emotion. Love is something that happens to us, right? Like you fall in love, which is fine, uh, but it also creates a lot of problems when you fall out of love which apparently happens all the time. And love in Paul's vision, love in the New Testament is so, so different. Um, Love is not primarily an emotion. Tim Mackey, uh, he says it this way. He says, love is a commitment to act for the well-being of another person ahead of my own well-being. So therefore, love is, is a key mark of a follower of Jesus because if I have given my allegiance and my devotion to Jesus Christ in faith... And, and, and he loved me, i.e. he died for me, he gave up his life for me, then a key mark of my life is, is that I do this for other people. And so that's what Paul is getting at, is he's seeing that, that there's this collection of people that are living their lives differently than how the culture is, is saying them. And they're living their lives under the reign of a different king. And that's really what Paul's praying for. Now, look at what he says next in verse 17. This is super interesting. He says, I keep asking. I keep asking, almost as if to say, I haven't stopped praying on your behalf. And, and this, is, uh, this is one of the most incredible insights into prayer that I think I've probably come across in the Bible. Uh, so often we think of prayer as crisis management, right? Like just think about the language that's used when the prayer requests come through. So-and-so needs your prayer because this bad thing happened or so-and-so ha- needs your prayer because this tragedy happened and, and so-and-so does need your prayers when bad things happen and when tragedies happen. But, but that's not what Paul's praying for here. Look what he's praying for. He says... You guys are doing so awesome, and you have this allegiance and this devotion to King Jesus, and you're showing love towards one another, and therefore, I haven't stopped praying for you. And we think, wait a minute, why would he be praying for them when when they're they're doing awesome? Like, that kind of sounds a little bizarre. 
and, and Paul would say exactly, they're doing great. And that's why I haven't stopped praying for them. And just imagine this playing out. Like, hey, hey man, I could really, really like, just, I really need your prayers. So yeah, well, what's, what's up? What's going on? I'm just crushing it right now, man. Just loving people well. I'm, I'm, I'm serving the poor. And my faith in, in God is strong. It's like, we laugh because it's kind of strange. This is not typically the framework through which we think about prayer. And the point is, is that Paul takes our idea of, of prayer and crisis management and he flips it on its head and he's saying, prayer is just adding fuel to the fire that is already burning. And, and for some of you, uh, it, it may not necessarily be like tragedy or like everything is going awesome, like these kind of two. Sometimes it's just right in the middle. It's, it's that lukewarmness and that apathy, right? And, and you just need to get next to the fire. Um, sociologists talk about a principle called mimetic desire, and this is really interesting. It means that basically you take on the values and the traits of the people that you hang around most. And so if you spend the majority of your time hanging around cynical, lukewarm people, guess what you'll become? And so if you want to be around passion, you know, surround yourself with people who really love God. And and this is why we so often invite you guys to, to join us in the prayer room on Wednesday mornings. This is why we often encourage folks to come to church on Sundays and not just to watch online. Watching online is fine, but we really encourage folks to be here in church, to be a part of Simple Churches. And it's not because there's like something magic that happens when you walk through these doors. Like you walk in and it's just glory like Narnia. That's not what's happening in here. But it's really more that the, the chance of you staying at home and pulling up something on your iPhone or your TV that cultivates pride, fear, or lust, creates cynicism and lukewarmness in your heart is very high. And the chances of that happening inside the walls of this building are very low. And so that's why we encourage people uh, to, to come. So think about the environment that you, you surround yourself with. Change your environment or let your environment change you. Um, I can't tell you how many times I uh, wake up in the mornings to go to our prayer sets and I'm like so unmotivated. Like I just don't want to do it and I'm thinking about all the places that I could be outside of going to this room to pray and then sometimes I'll just get in there and like I'll catch a spark from somebody and it's like my heart goes from apathy to like glory, like Psalm 46, the earth is the Lord's and all that's in it and I'm like so excited and so full of energy and passion and I'm like where did that come from? Because I, I didn't feel that way when I walked in. And the point is, is that hunger for God is contagious, and so surround yourself with hungry people. Now, check out what Paul prays for next. He, he continues, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And again, this is really interesting. Uh, Notice that Paul doesn't pray for their circumstances at all. When we pray, we most often pray for circumstances, and and that's good because circumstances are very real. And for many of you, you walk in through these doors this morning to to Sunday at church, and the circumstances of life are just like handing it to you. Um, in, In my three years of being a part of this church of working on staff here. I I don't know if there's ever been a season where more serious, desperate prayer requests have come through. And this isn't like, hey man, can you pray for my test scores? This is like, we we got the diagnosis back and and it's serious. It's it's that family member took their life. It's uh, our newborn is is having life-altering surgery and and the future is uncertain. It's, It's the relationship didn't work out and we're left picking up the pieces. And if that's you today, I really believe that God has something for you in this. What's interesting is Paul prays for something else, almost as if to communicate that there is something that you need that is greater than a change to your circumstances. And so what does he pray for? He prays that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that whatever the circumstance may be in your life, that you would see this as an opportunity for you to draw closer to Jesus in relationship, so that you may know him better. Uh, just think about uh, our guy at the beginning, Friedrich von Budelschwing. When the Nazis came knocking at the door, and they show up with guns, saying that we want to take over the care, i.e. kill, these people, it probably was very easy for him to think to himself, uh, God, you've abandoned me. Where are you, Jesus? Like, wh- what happened? And what Paul would apparently say 
is Friedrich, you're, you're on a journey, and this is an opportunity for you to trust Jesus in a way that you haven't had to trust him before. And this becomes a, a beautiful moment of growth. And I can only imagine that, that it was these types of prayers that sustained him during really difficult circumstances. What about you? What circumstances do you find yourself in this morning that God might be inviting you in into an opportunity of growth? So Paul continues his prayer, and uh, he's going to pray for three specific revelations for the church. Uh, and, and the first two are awesome. The third one is, is where the dynamite's at, but we've got to start with the first two. So Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know and experience, number one, the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So the first is the hope of God's call. Uh, the Christian life is centrally about taking on a posture of hope. Uh, Viktor Frankl is a guy that you may have heard of, and I think that he probably wrote one of the most important books of the last hundred years, a book called Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read it, it's absolutely worth a read, but Frankl was a, a Holocaust survivor. He, he survived three of the, the Nazi death camps, including Auschwitz, and he was a, a brilliant psychologist, and he asked the question, why do some people make it and other people give in to despair? And what he was able to come up with is, is that the people who were able to see beyond the gates of Auschwitz into another age and into another time, the people whose hope was not just in their present circumstances were often the ones who made it. And I think part of the reason why there is so little hope and there is so much despair in our world today is that we've removed a horizon beyond the world that we can see, and we've said that this is all that there is. And so what that means is that, that hope in our, in our walk with God is holding the conviction that my present circumstances don't get to determine the meaning of my life. And so whatever the present state of the world is, whatever the present state of your life is, those circumstances don't get the last word. And Christian hope is, a, is about the fact that in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus, something so surprising happened, something so counterintuitive, something so strange, that if I believe in God, I have to be open to the idea that my life may be terrible and the circumstances and the state of the world may be terrible, but I believe in a God who brings life out of death. I believe in a God who came to dwell among us to bear the result of all the, the sin and the selfishness that I carry every single day and to create new life of, out of that that can spread and can multiply to affect other people. And that is the God that we serve. And, and so if that's the God that we believe in, then one of the disciplines of the Christian life is that we never forget, and this is what Paul's praying for, never forget that there is a future hope and a calling in store for us. And that's connected to, to the second thing, that he prays for. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, the eyes of your heart may be opened, that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, Paul is taking a handful of different phrases right out of the Old Testament, and they're phrases that were used to describe God's chosen covenant people, the ancient Israelites who he rescued out of slavery in Egypt. And just to give you a flavor, this is just one of the passages that he's borrowing from. Uh, this, is, this is Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses is, is speaking to the people of Israel. And Moses says, For you, Israel, are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Now the idea here isn't that God likes Israelites more than he likes everybody else. That's not what, what he's trying to say. This is the, the theme of election in the Bible, and this is really important. So, so Paul's deep conviction is, is that this covenant family that, that God started in the Old Testament by redeeming Israel, by rescuing them, has now come to its fulfillment in the Messiah, in King Jesus. And so what that means is that if you are in this room and you are in Christ Jesus, you now are a part of his chosen family, God's most precious Inheritance. Uh, for a long time, I, I read this verse and I thought that he was referring to our inheritance, like meaning heaven or something like that. But that's not what he's praying for. 
Paul prays that we would wake up to the fact that we are God's own special treasured possession. Uh, John Calvin, I thought, said it really well. He, He says this, This is the highest honor of the church, that until he is united to us, the Son of God reckons himself in some measure incomplete. And so, uh, do you realize that if you're sitting here in this room this morning, regardless of what you're feeling, how you feel about your position before God, you are God's treasured possession. You're his treasured possession. Let that sink in. Um, I, I've, I've always enjoyed going to museums, and I think a little bit of it's because I'm introverted, and I just like being at museums, and usually you can just look at stuff and people don't talk to you. Um, but uh, I, 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 I love art. I, I really do. I've, I've found an appreciation for art. And one thing that has always blown my mind is the price that art collectors are willing to pay for their most treasured pieces of art. I mean, it really, it's amazing. And, and just to give you a flavor of this, um, I'm going to th- show you three pieces. So the first, this is, uh, this is uh, by Andy Warhol. This is called Campbell's Soup Cans. This was 1962. Some of you have probably seen this very famous piece. Any guess is what this sold for? It's, it's pictures of soup. I mean, you got pepper pot soup right there. And we think Denver were the, the first weed people, you know? Um, any idea what, what this sold for? $11.8 million. Pictures of Campbell's soup cans. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is called Untitled by Kai Twombly. 1967, any guesses? $70.5 million this sold for. Billy's two-year-old is up in the nursery just pumping these things out right now. (laughs) Three ways to give, Brody, three ways to give. Okay, the third, and this is my favorite. Riley showed me this one. Uh, This is Comedian. It's called Comedian. This is a banana taped to a wall. This was 2019, $120,000. What what happens when the banana rots? And the point, the point is this, is that what determines the value of the art is not the art itself, but what a buyer is willing to pay for it. And what determines the value of you is not what you do for God, but the price that was paid for you, a price that cost Jesus his life. And Paul prays that, that we would wake up to this privilege, but also the responsibility and the calling of what it means to be a part of God's treasured possession. And that's connected to the third thing that he prays for, and this is where it gets fun. Uh, So Paul prays, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you would know his incomparably great power for us who believe. I call this the greatness of God's power. Uh, I don't know what you think of when you you hear the word power, uh, but for most of us, it's probably not very positive. It's because a lot of us have grown up in the 21st century, and we're kind of jaded, disenfranchised human beings who have kind of seen the generations that have come before us that have abused power, and so we're somewhat cynical towards power. Uh, But oftentimes, when we think of power, we think of how modern psychologists would, would define it, and they say this. It's the ability to control the behavior of other people. So the most powerful people in the world... Uh, like the Forbes lists, are those who are perceived to have the greatest influences over human beings, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, my favorite, Taylor Swift. She's actually part of that list. Shake it off. Um, and it's for this reason that, that I think Paul in this text is really, he's really precise to qualify, to, to clear up any misunderstandings about kind of all these jaded views of power. And uh, he's going to talk about a really specific kind of power that's available to us as Christians. Uh, completely countercultural to, to the distorted views that our culture has of power. And this is what he says. He says, that power is the same power as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. All clear? Just kidding. It's kind of deep. Sometimes Ephesians is hard to understand. I I joked with Jason this week that we should rename this series to Ephesians. What on earth is Paul talking about? So what he's not talking about is power to control or to dominate or to like be an influencer for Jesus. It's it's very different. But rather, the, the, the power that is available to us is the same kind of power that transformed the death of Jesus into resurrection life. It's the kind of power that gives up status and authority to absorb and to take the hit on behalf of others, to allow the sin of others to completely crush him. 
But because his commitment to humanity is so strong and his love and mercy for sinful, broken human beings is so strong, he has the power to reverse death into life. And, and so what this means for us is that this is the power to take the most sinful, most tragic, most desperate human beings and through an encounter with Jesus, turn them into something that is actually life-giving. Uh, the, the past few Sundays, I, I, I took notice of a guy, a gentleman in our church. And some of you may have taken notice of this guy, and he, he gave me permission, by the way, to, to share this story. Um, but uh, during worship, like there was an Easter and the last Sunday, I, I just hear this man, and during worship, he's just like audibly exclaiming, glory, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, glory, over and over and over. And I'm like, I gotta meet this guy. <laughs> Because uh, I, oftentimes we just don't see that type of, like, we don't see that type of zeal for God. And so uh, I connect with him out on the patio last Sunday, and he tells me that his name is Anthony. And I just, I just ask him, like, hey, can you, can you share a little bit of your story with me? And he comes from a really tough background, really tough circumstances. He actually moved here from New York City, and he was a part of the LGBTQ community in New York City. And he just went on to tell me uh, uh, the brokenness that he felt and how his life was, was a tragedy, and how his life w- was desperate, desperate circumstances, and how Jesus saved him and redeemed him, and how today his life looks completely different. And, and the way that he found about Rest- Restoration Church is he's walking by to the bus stop, and he walks in. And, and his life has been transformed so much so that he now brings people to church every single Sunday. Last, last week he brought a friend so that they too can hear about Jesus. And I just asked him, I said, Anthony, like... I don't meet a lot of people like you. Where, where do you get your hope from? And without batting an eye, he says, I know who I am in Christ, and if Jesus can save me, he can save anyone. Anyone. And that is a man who gets it. That is the gospel made visible in somebody's life. That is an example of the kind of power that we carry as Christians. And so that's the first element of power. And, uh, and then Paul talks about a second element of power, and this is where things get, get wild. So, so stick with me. So he goes on to say that uh, the, the power is the same as the, the mighty power that raised Christ from the dead, that seated him at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And so a big theme throughout all of Ephesians that we're going to see in the next several weeks Uh, But also a big part of our our Christian worldview is that we have to be open or trying to be open to uh, the reality that that what our eyes see in the physical world is not all that presents itself to us. And as products of the 21st century where we're, you know, generally think that what you can see, taste, touch, smell, hear is all that there is to reality, what I'm about to tell you is going to be probably a hard pill to swallow. Um... But Paul has this idea that, that, and you see it throughout all the scriptures, that there exists another realm of created human beings who have real influence uh, over human beings and human history, but they're not visible to us. And some of you are like, okay, that got way too weird for me. And if that's you, I I just want to encourage you that it's actually not as weird as you may think. Um, If you study modern physics, uh, namely something called string theory, anyone ever heard of string theory? Okay, modern physics string theory, which if, if you don't know what string theory is, this is just a, a short summary. Clear? Billy, this was too much for Billy. I, I understood it. it was just a lot for him. So that's string theory. Okay, but, but the idea behind string theory is, is that it's common, accepted scientific understanding that there are multiple dimensions that exist outside of the four that we experience. So we experience space and time. Right? Space is height, length, depth, and then time is the fourth dimension. But string theory, proven commonplace science, is that there are multiple fifth, sixth, seventh dimensions that exist, that interact with the the dimensions that we live in, but are not perceptible to us at all. And so what this means is that we have to be open to the reality that there are things that are real that exist in other dimensions that we will never see, okay? And um, the, the, the Bible's view of spiritual realities is that there are spirits non-physical beings who are influencing individual human beings to exploit our, our sinfulness and our selfishness and just make a horrible mess out of everything. And, and some of us, you know, we experience what this feels like personally. Now, the Bible would also 
ask us to entertain the idea that there are created beings in other dimensions that have influence over entire societies, entire cultures, exploiting the collective sin and selfishness of, of lots of human beings to create a huge mess. And let's just think of, of one example that, that illustrates this. And I, I would just kind of I would just put that before you and just ask you, like, how do you go about explaining evil in our world? What's your frame of reference that you use to explain it? Um, so, so one example, uh, back to, to World War II. Uh, so here you have Hitler. Hitler is the key figure. But, you know, you've got to remember, it was an entire society. It wasn't just Hitler. There was a lot of people invol- involved in, in Nazi Germany. And what we have to remember about Nazi Germany is that, like, Nazi Germany was the pinnacle of human progress. In the 18, late 1800s, leading up to the 1920s, the 1930s, uh, Germany was the pinnacle of everything that humanity had going for in technology, in philosophy, in education. And so, so here you have this like, most sophisticated culture on planet Earth, and between World War I and World War II, within 15 years, it becomes an accepted and good idea to eliminate the lives of millions of human beings so that the culture can progress forward. How do you explain that? Well, in some sense, you could say, well, Hitler and, and all the Nazis were really, really evil, selfish people. And, and, and that's a frame of, of reference that Paul often uses to describe evil. Very often, in Philippians, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in another sense, Paul would say, it's the powers. It's the powers, dude. There, there's something else that's going on. And the point is this. The power that is available to us in Christ Jesus The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that Jesus has and that we also have to to push back on the kingdom of darkness and to live lives of faith and allegiance to King Jesus. Whatever cultural moment you find yourself in, I mean, some of you may think, well, I don't live in Nazi Germany. And you're right, we don't live in Nazi Germany. We don't live in the death of the body. We live in the death of the soul, right? Uh, uh, Philosophers talk about that we live in the age of the anxious man, the anxious man, where we're, we're riddled with depression and anxiety, and suicide, and apathy, and depression, and meaninglessness. And so what, what the power that God gives us is the power to live this countercultural lifestyle, to live under the reign of a different king. And so as we just close today, uh, I want to share the last verse in our text, and this is the best. This is my favorite. So verse 22, uh, Paul concludes his prayer. He says, And God placed all things under his feet, and he appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And and, uh, this is so important. We may get the idea that, yes, Jesus is king of my life, and, you know, he's king of, of these spiritual realms, but that's actually not what Paul's saying. What Paul's saying, according to verse 22, is that Jesus is king of everything. What's included in everything? Everything. Everything. And this can create a, a real contradiction for a lot of us because we live in Denver, Colorado, and so you're, just like, you're saying, Tim, you're, Jesus is the king of Denver? Like, what does that mean? That's kind of a bizarre statement. But, but I, I'd never picked up on this. This has never struck me. He goes on to say that he's appointed, appointed him to be king over everything for what specific people? For the church. For the church. And so in other words, Jesus is, is king of everything, but does everybody recognize that fact? No. And so what that means is that uh, this, this little fairy tale landscape of grace that we call Restoration Church, living under the reign of a different king, we will be different. There will be people in our lives, friends, family members, people that you work with, that will not recognize the, the lordship of King Jesus. And uh, this week, um, I experienced uh, the sometimes sobering and painful reality of what it feels like to actually live this out. And and I just had a a brutal week. I had a really tough family situation. And uh, some of you you know know my story. I wasn't always supposed to be a pastor. This really wasn't what was in the cards for me. And and in many ways, I was expected to be something different um, in the family that I grew up with. Grew up in, in some ways, what I'm doing right now goes against what was expected of me. And so over the years, but especially more recently, I have made decisions in my life 
uh, decisions motivated by the Holy Spirit in, in allegiance and in devotion to King Jesus that have cultivated deep disappointment in who I am. It's a tough pill to swallow. And so this past week, uh, I, I'm, I, I do what I often do when circumstances in life are difficult, and I go for a prayer walk, and I'm prayer walking this like half a mile length kind of stretch of my street that I live on. I lived there for seven years. And I prayer walk this street hundreds of times. And very, very rarely do I ever encounter anybody. And I, I'm just walking and I'm talking to God about everything. And I come across this man who's just sitting on his porch reading this big book out loud, like massive book, like that thick. And I'm kind of like walking and I'm like sort of noticing him and observing him. And I just stop. And I just say, hey, what, what book are you reading? He says, I'm, I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. What, like, what part are you in? And he says, uh, I'm reading 1 Timothy. And so we, we just strike up a conversation, and, and he goes on to tell me a little bit of his story, how COVID was super brutal on him, and he felt like his life was lacking meaning, all the things that we're talking about. And so he was investigating faith. He wasn't a Christian, but he was starting to investigate faith by reading the word of God, and so I just went on to tell him a little bit about my story and how I'm a pastor who works in Denver, and I introduced myself, and, and his jaw drops, <laughs> and I'm staring at him, and he's staring at me, and we're kind of in this like awkward stare off as he's on his patio, and I'm on the street, and I kind of look at him, and he kind of looks at me, and he says, you know, it, it just struck me that I'm sitting here praying, and I'm reading the word of God, the, the book of First Timothy, and a pastor named Timothy walks on my doorstep. And in that moment, as I'm praying, God, would you open the eyes of my heart? Would you enlighten me to understand what's happening in all these just difficult circumstances? God reminded me that the meaning of my life is not found in my circumstances, no matter what people may say, right? The meaning of my life is not found in my circumstances. God reminded me that I am his treasured possession, and he is so kind to remind me why I'm a pastor when I'm praying. He reminded me uh, that, uh, that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the power that was working in this man's heart and in my heart, and he connected us, and he let me be a part of it. How cool is that? That's the God that we serve. And so restoration, if, if, if we come together in this room today and a gathering of Christians means anything, it means that we are gathering as people who are living gospel-centered lives as a community under the reign of a completely different king. And so when the powers that be come in to invade our lives personally through, through anxiety and depression and apathy, but also when they come to invade our families and it, through, through schools and through the places that we work, we stand firm and we say that in this house we serve a different king. We serve a different king and we do things differently here. I just want to invite you guys uh, as we close into a time of just prayer and reflection and so I'll just invite you guys to, to, to bow your heads and to close your eyes. And I just want to ask two questions. And the first question is this, is what are the areas in your life personally where you profess allegiance to Jesus, but your life doesn't reflect that in any way? To ask the Holy Spirit to bring these areas to your mind and just say, Jesus, I give these to you. The second question is this, uh, what would it look like if you were to start small and just let one of those areas come under the influence of King Jesus? And as the Holy Spirit just brings these things to your mind, just say, God, I, I give this to you. I give this to you.
Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, God, that we can come together as your church and that we can gather in your presence. God, that is a privilege that we do not take lightly. Father, uh, we just say right now boldly that we serve a different king in this room. And so, God, I pray in confidence that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we may come to know, God, the hope that we have in you, God, that we are your treasured possession, and that we walk every day with an incomparably great power. So, Jesus, open the eyes of our hearts through worship. Open the eyes of our hearts, God, through self-examination and communion, and reveal yourself to us. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen.